Okay, we looked at John 8. You are of your father the devil. Expression of close relationship. Spiritual descent, as it were. Easily incited to sin, violence, falsehood. <coughs> because they're of the world. They've been worked in as the sons of disobedience. Then I believe we made a quick look I couldn't quite remember, but I think we had a quick look at Matthew 16, 23. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. Do we, uh, we talked a little bit about that. This, well, let's deal with that then. Get behind me, Satan. Always reminds me every time I read that, and this is the sort of thing you probably don't want popping up in your mind every time of how people have made jokes about getting behind me Satan. I think it's a serious statement that's made and should not be dismissed lightheartedly. But I've heard people do that. He got behind me and pushed me straight in where I shouldn't have been. Things to, to that effect. And it's the serious words of Christ highlighting very effectively that Satan using Peter was a major problem. Jesus is rebuking Peter, yet he's addressing Satan. And that causes questions to arise. And when you look at the commentaries and different articles, they're trying to explain this relationship, this rebuke of Peter, and that's clear, yet addressing Satan directly. And when you summarize the commentaries or you take a look at how they've tried to deal with it, so most of the main commentaries, there's two options that are expressed. One option is rather interesting. Peter was an instrument of the devil through actual possession at that time. Doesn't seem a viable option to me at all. Matthew 16, why? Because when you look down at the record, Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's in verse 16. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's a statement by Peter and a statement by Jesus, I think, indicating that Peter is born again at this point. He has, his heart understood who Jesus was. I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Seems to be straightforward declaration of Peter's right relationship with God. So it would be very difficult to, further down in the passage Notwithstanding Peter sinning, saying, God forbid me, God forbid it, Lord, that this should happen to you, it would be very difficult for me to conclude that when Jesus said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, that he was affirming or declaring or in some way pointing to demon possession, was Satan being in possession of Peter? It's not a possibility. The second option is far more acceptable that he was an instrument, however unintentional, by his hasty words, his misguided zeal, placing himself, therefore, on the side of Satan, and ends up opposing what Jesus said. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things and be killed and be raised up the third day. He's resisting, opposing the revealed will of God. And so he has made himself an instrument of the devil. And I said, however unintentional his hasty words may have done it, that's what happened. Then explanations are offered to explain this because Satan, the mechanics of it, because Satan is not a general appellative, a designation, a descriptive designation for adversary. 
It's a proper title that is not used elsewhere in the gospel in a very general sense. It's the title of the devil. It's the substantive for Satan. The imperative, get behind me, Satan, is seen by quite a number of commentators as too reminiscent of the wilderness temptation account. This was just like that particular event when a serious test was imposed upon Christ by Satan to try and lure him or entice him to go the way of the world. You know, you can have power, etc. You can rule over kingdoms, you can be great. It seems to be too reminiscent of that. And that would reject the general sense of of the word, it would make it specific, and that Jesus very promptly and very decisively, immediately, repudiates Peter's words. Certainly, that can be seen. Rejection of what he said, sternly, by Christ Jesus. You are a stumbling block to me. Now notice the subtle switch that is occurring here when you Look at the explanations following the imperative. Get behind me, Satan. You. Who's the antecedent of you? Must be Peter. Right? Because if you follow on, it says, you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. That would be a reference to Peter thinking like a man. Self-centered thinking perhaps. Not willing to submit to the revelation of God, God's will. So here's the imperative to Satan. And then the pronoun referring to Peter. Man's thoughts. And at the beginning of the verse, Jesus turned and said to Peter. It would seem to settle the argument that obviously the reference to Satan is indicative of the fact that man's thoughts and Satan's thoughts, Satan's thoughts run in the same track. So you can synthesize by putting these together Obviously, Peter's words constituted a trap for Christ. They were enticing him to stray from the will of God, which would be to sin. So Peter's words immediately are seen to be resisting the revealed will of God, not misguided zeal to protect Christ, but have become representative, according to Morris and others, of the wilderness temptations, a serious Peter, you, maybe you just don't realize the seriousness of what you've done. That the interests of men, insofar as they relate to the revelation of Christ and the cross, are incompatible with and antithetical to the interests of God on the same subject. Think about that. That when man tries to express what he would prefer to have, what his interests are, especially when it relates to the cross, Christ, revelation of the will of God about salvation and so on. Mankind, thinking in man's track, is not going to have thoughts that are compatible with God's will. Okay? He's going to want to do it in some other fashion. Man is self-centered. He thinks about himself first. He wants things for his own benefit. This is not the way to go. It can't be. Because that's going to take Christ away from me, Peter's thinking perhaps. Incompatibility and antithetical nature seems to be the focus of attention. You, you ask yourself the question when you step into the next verse. Then Jesus said to his disciples, obviously they, they heard the response to Peter, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Any bearing on that statement from the preceding context? I think so. 
Your interests are man's, not God's. Now, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. It, it, it highlights very effectively. You can't run your life before God your way. The disciple follows the revealed will of God and doesn't resist. So get rid of that self-centered thinking. Say no to that to which you normally submit. And if you've had Theology 3, we, you know we pick up on this under discipleship, so I don't want to go through the whole context now. But you, a, a disciple is a, how do I put it, non-self-centered person. He submitted to the will of God for his life from the, from the first point on. You want to be my disciple? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Submit to the reign of the King of Kings. So it's easily understood. Peter, you're on Satan's side by the comment. You know, I, th I think that's a terrific warning for you and I. Be careful by what you say, lest you take Satan's sight without even thinking about it. You want to be seen as taking God's side, which means, what? how do you know what God's side on things are? Yeah, if you don't go to Scripture, if you don't know the Word of God, you don't have that framework in your thinking at all. It'll be man-made philosophy, and Scripture stands against man-made philosophy. Warns you about it. Okay, any questions on that one? Stumbly block and the mindset. This is what you are by what you said. If anything, it drives home for me. My mindset, that is the frame of reference, the matrix in my mind by which I quickly express myself, I have my thoughts directing the focus of my thought life and my physical life, is to be constructed by the precepts and principles of truth, not my own eclectic philosophy. My worldview is a biblical one. That's what it's emphasizing secondarily here. If your worldview is a biblical one, you don't make statements that put you on the wrong side. Now you come to John 6 and verse 17, you have an intriguing statement. Very similar to perhaps to Matthew 16. Did, did I myself not choose you the twelve? And one of you is a devil. That's incredible. Deliberate choice into the band of the twelve, the one that would betray. The penetrating question in verse 67. Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? It's quite a question to ask. Because in the immediate context, preceding context, there were those that left. This is a difficult statement, some of them said. Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe and who it was that would betray him. Many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. A fascinating statement in its own right. Disciples withdrew from him, walked no more. They appeared to be where they really so. And so he asks these 12, since he's picked them, since they're part of the inner group, since they've been with him for a long time, you're going to leave too? Has it come to that? Lord, this is the Simon Peter now. To whom do we go? You have words of eternal life. And a recognition of the deity of Christ. You are the Holy One of God. 
We have believed and we have come to know this is who you are. What had been revealed to Peter, of course, Matthew 16, was exactly who Jesus was. And this is affirmed now. And we have believed you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus' response sort of deflects attention from that statement. Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, all of you? And one of you is a devil? Quite a serious, drastic pronouncement. Chosen a devil. Problem? Determining how devil applies to Judas because Diabolos in the Gospels is consistently a substantive for Satan. Several solutions have been proposed. Hengstenberg and Mayer, for example, emphasize strongly the adjective, the adjectival aspect, the devilish character making, in other words, one of you is a devil, making that an adjectival statement. One of you is devilish. And secondarily, seeing in, in, in that the instrumentality that is, puts them under the influence of Satan. So you be, you, you're an, Judas, you're an instrument of Satan because you have a devilish character. But that would be true of all men, wicked, open therefore to being the sons of disobedience in which the prince of the power of the air works. With all, all of us, with earth, because of earthly wisdom and earthly source in our thinking, etc., are devilish. That's one of the ways of expressing it. This is how you describe Judas Iscariot. Or you can take it as signifying adversary. I mean, sorry, second one. You can emphasize the substantival aspect. The noun, he was a devil. And secondarily, you express something of devilish character. That is, that's why he was so easily used by Satan. He was the devil. And in the spirit of the devil, he opposed the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you have a, a statement that is made in verse 71. Now, he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, which reminds you, of the statements that have, that have been made in the preceding context where 12 has been used two times, said to the 12, you're going to leave? Have not I chosen you the 12? Now he meant Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, who was going to betray him. So there's one that of the 12 who would leave. Okay. 11 wouldn't. Because they're not like the disciples that withdrew no genuineness, no reality to them. But there's one who was going to leave. How would he leave? How did Judas leave? And he was he was around. We know he was a thief from the beginning. He put his hand in the purse in the bank a little too much, apparently. How did he finally leave the twelve? When he betrayed him, and the betrayal was at the instigation of Satan. Yeah, John 13, verses 2 and 27. Had already put into his heart to betray Christ. And then at the end, the other disciples, apparently distracted and not aware of what has been said, at least they didn't understand what has been said, John 13, verse 27. That only time this is recorded in Scripture, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, apparently knowing exactly what had happened at that moment, what do you do, do quickly. Out he went to betray the Christ. Fascinating. One of you is a devil. Adversary. I like the conclusion finally drawn by a guy called Pote. Did a 
many years ago a Bachelor of Divinity monograph at Grace Seminary, and he sees the term as signifying adversary, but with a residual element of future complete control. He's sort of combining two things, adversarial plus being fully under the control of so that his adversarial nature reaches its peak. Chosen to betray. Chosen to be used as an instrument of Satan. All part of the will of God. It was not going, the way to the cross was not going to be without the betrayer who would, who would go to his own place. Okay, that's the instrumentality of Satan. Using Peter using Judas. Peter's is expressing that which is on the side of man, therefore on the side of Satan. Judas is not genuine at all, but he's given to violent betrayal. Can it stand as a warning to you and I in any way? What's a practical application from one of you as a devil? Can be sure to the last. Um, but I'm not sure you'll have to explain. It can't be sure to the last, till the last. Yourself or about others? Yeah, it, it makes you take more, pay more attention to the warnings of Scripture about how men can be used as instruments of Satan, or how the devil can get a hold of a person. Pride, materialism, which would be part of Judas's problem, a life of deceitfulness that had developed. And you're right, laying hold suddenly on a young man to put him, put him into a leadership office can do that. But it's a secondary practical application, isn't it? Because the main consideration in the passage is just simply this. God designed the whole program to go the way of a betrayer. And it's a sovereign involvement of God here I, I, I see the warning, but I've got to be careful I don't go looking for something that may not be primarily there. Facts are this. This is what God has done. This is what Judas did. This is what happened to Christ. This was in fulfillment of his plan. Okay. However, there is more application for Matthew 16. Don't well, you can't be too careful, put it that way, about what you say. It, for me, it stands up as a, be careful before you react too quickly, because when you react too quickly, you say things you wish you could take back. But once the words are gone, they're gone. It's like the, the problem in many churches today is the ubiquitous email that says too much too quickly to too many, causing too much trouble. Why? Because the tendency is to, you get upset about something. This happened in a church recently that I know. And some guy got upset about something. He sat down at 11 p.m. at night, <coughs> bashed out a response to what he perceived as the problem in the church, hit the send button, <coughs> gone to all the members of the church. Couldn't get it back. A lot of trouble. In fact, the church closed down. And there was one of the catalysts. Yeah. I was just thinking about what James says about the tongue being set on fire back down. Yeah. Good parallel. So when your words get spoken too quickly, you can't get them back. It's like the email that's gone. You can't recover what you've sent. You'd like to try. Too late. Okay. 
Let's take a look at John 12, 31. 14, 30, 16, 11. Little snapshots from the teachings of Jesus, I guess you could call these, filling out some of the things we kind of skipped through because they fitted in the list, the grocery list that I gave of opposition, of reaction. John 12, 31. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was going to die. 14.30 in its context. You've heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. We've seen that verse before. Now I've told you before it comes to pass. That when it comes to pass, you may believe. I'll not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Let us go from here. In 16, let's put verse 11 in context. Verse 8, And when He, that's the Spirit, when He comes will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer behold me. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Many more things to say. Got to wait for a later time. Okay, now keep that in mind, and you'll see that in, there's a similar emphasis in each of the contexts. Very obvious one here. Satan is the ruler of the world. That was in 1231. Let me go back there. Ruler of the world, where Archon, should be Archon, is the one in position of power and authority. Do you understand what I did with the keyboard to get a pie instead of a row? Just to see if you're awake this afternoon. How did I get a pie instead of a row? Because I automatically went to the P instead of the R on the keyboard. I finally figured out why some of my Greek words come out wrong because I type a V for a nun, but, but it doesn't come out as a nun. And then if you're doing it fast, you don't see it. Suddenly realized as I looked down now, that's why you keep getting that pie in your words. Archon. Position of power and authority. And we're the two cosmu of the world is the system or the order that is at enmity with God. Opposed to Him in every respect. Enmity, hostility. The system, the order, that entity that is certainly not on God's side. But another clear emphasis also surfaces. That's the immediate prospect of Christ's death on the cross. It's in all three. In 1231, it's underscored by the fact, by the expression, the hour has come. Verse 23 of John 12. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
verse 27. Now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. And also by the reference to his being glorified, by the illustration of the grain of wheat that must fall into the ground and die, and by the distinct mention of his death on the cross, in verses 32 and 33, we are being lifted up from the earth, is a reference to being nailed to the cross. Save me from this hour. This hour has come consistently pointing to the hour of his death, to the passion, with the distinct mention of his death in the context, you know, it's pointing to that period of time which he'd warned his disciples about that he would be betrayed, be betrayed and die. Don't ask the question about will draw all men to myself. Deal with that in Theology 3. For now we'll just take it as a statement of the significant influence of the death of Christ. The hour has come. The hour of darkness is what it's referred to elsewhere. His being glorified refers to what? time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified must be a reference to his death but probably includes within the semantic range of being glorified or the action that's pointed to his resurrection and his ascension would, would cover all three I think in 1430 and 1611 since these are part of the farewell discourse which was preparing the disciples for the coming death of Christ and preparing them for the fact that he was going away and they wouldn't see him for a while but the Spirit would come in his place it's fairly usual to take the statement the Prince of the World is coming as a reference to his passion in other words it's the equivalent of saying the hour has come it's the hour of darkness. So whether you said the hour has come or the hour of darkness has its moment or the prince of this world is coming, you're expressing the fact that the passion has begun. If anything, Satan has instigated men to the point where, where they want to crucify the Christ in the providence of God. In both these contexts, 12, 31 and 16, 11, they are statements of judgment where I think judged, and Leon Morris points this out in his The Cross in the New Testament takes a look at the use of judgment. Old Testament sense of victory over the enemy. That fits the context extremely well. And ek balo is used as well. Supports that context. Supports that meaning. Defeated. Purposes overthrown. His will set aside, deposed from any position of ascendancy or authority he might have, he's finished. Kekritai and nun crisis esten point to the certainty of judgment and to the effectiveness of that judgment. Has been judged. That's it. He's a defeated foe. Active but lost. 16.11 and 3.11.14 there's a connection to Christ's death and to the work of the Spirit who comes after the departure of Christ. Carson, in a preliminary to his commentary on John's Gospel, the farewell discourse and the final prayer of Jesus made a good comment. The cross work of Jesus Christ is the crucial turning point in the history of redemption. We'd all agree. As it is the basis of the believer's salvation, and it is, so also is it the pivotal, good word, pivotal defeat of the prince of this world. Excellent statement by Carson. 
setting it where it should be in your understanding. A number of additional emphases are provided in the context. First one, he has nothing in me. Emphatic declaration about the non-claim of the ruler. Drop back to 14 verse 30. No claims. Nothing that he can charge Christ with. Nothing that he can grab a hold of in the life of Christ at all. The ruler of this world can't do anything here because of the difference between Christ and us. As Christ looked at the passion events coming up soon and saw the mastermind Satan and his involvement, he made that emphatic declaration. I'll put three points here for you so you can understand what I'm trying to get at. It is sin that gives Satan his hold on men. But Jesus has no sin as others do. He's fully man, but he's impeccable. And Christ, therefore, and Tasker draws this conclusion in his little commentary, Christ did not belong to the system of that ruler. He's not of the world. In other words, he's not one who is to be classified as the son of disobedience in whom Satan works. Okay? He is not needed to be redeemed out of darkness into light. He doesn't belong to the world. And whatever Satan's challenge may be to the Christ in his life, it's going to fail. Why? Because the Savior loves the Father. Verse 31, that the world may know that I love the Father, and so I do his commandments. That's an important statement. The Savior's love for the Father is seen in that he does exactly what he was commissioned to do, which was to go to the cross. Thus, Satan's hostile adversarial stance will fail. Can't undo the plan of God. Carson again comments, he dies as a loving and obedient son in voluntary self-sacrifice. That's the important phrase, self-sacrifice, because it points to the fact that he laid down his life. Nobody took it from him. He laid it down of his own. Not as a pathetic or guilty victim enmeshed in the tangles of fate or ensnared in the web of sin. He died because he chose to die. He died because the Father chose for him to die. Okay. Good emphasis pick up on in the passage. Impeccability. No charge, no accusation, nothing that would make him fail in his task. And by the way, I find that intriguing when I put it alongside of the earlier passage. Think about it. Get behind me, Satan. You shame the interests of men, not of God. Put it in connection or alongside the wilderness temptations. Do this, do that, have this, have that. Call on angels, etc. Yet there was never a second when he would fail. Find it intriguing and should recall to your mind all the treatment of peccability, impeccability, the feeling of tem the force of temptation. We didn't actually come to this text. It, it probably fits back there. No handle can Satan get on me. There's nothing here at all. It's the only man that ever said that, could ever say that, endured temptation. 
intriguing. Come to the next page that I've given you. To that section concerning judgment under John 12, John 14 and John 16, John 16, 11 as those statements about concerning judgment. It, it, it belongs more to the section on the Spirit. Spirit's conviction of the world, which is an important thing to keep in mind. It's His convicting of the world. Therefore, we probably ought to keep a balance in the way you explain convicting sin, righteousness and judgment. It's elenjo to convince of, to convict of something concerning Zelenko Peri, which would be to convince of or to convict of, tells you the content of what, what is involved. And the reason for the convicting each, in each area is mentioned. For each statement has its own haughty clause concerning sin, concerning righteousness concerning judgment haughty because in each case the three elements should probably be kept in balance when dealing with this keep some sort of symmetry in, in the triad not breaking up the reasons that are given what, what usually happens is, and I made a little note to this effect, and you could probably follow it through the commentaries. If you, I didn't cite the commentaries here, I looked at the, quite a few of them, and the Biblia footnoting would be too substantial. The world's sin, Christ's righteousness, and the world's judgment. That's usually what happens. I think you can understand why. Convicts the world of its sin, that's easily understood. Convicts the world of the righteousness of Christ is what he usually is opted for. And then convicts the world of its judgment. But why not maintain a symmetry in the passage by viewing it as the Spirit convicting the world of its sin, its righteousness, its judgment? Okay, keep the symmetry there, the parallel, and try to understand what's been said. I refer you to um, an article by Carson in JBL, where he gives a very substantial treatment, rather technically. It's a JBL article on, on these on John 16, I, I don't have it with me. I leave it. John Carson's JBL article, very careful treatment of why it is better to maintain symmetry in these verses. So, convicting the world of its sins, no problem. Obviously, it needs to be convinced, brought to the point of understanding that it is indeed sinful. The world's not going to draw that conclusion on its own, you, to be sure. Of its righteousness, by that is meant that there is a castigation here pointing to all false judgment, all false understanding, all of its own right. Remember, the world can be spoken of as having a righteousness of its own. You, men can be said to have righteousness, which is a wrong righteousness. Isaiah 64 being a particular example. All false judgment of which the condemnation of Christ is the supreme example. It's clearly easily understood. The world is wrong, absolutely wrong, in its fundamental assessment of all things spiritual, including its understanding of Christ in his person and his work. In fact, the world, uh, 
probably sees the crucifixion of Christ the being lifted up as a demonstration of his unrighteousness and of their own righteousness. But it's completely the other way around. They need to be convicted of the fact that it's not his unrighteousness that put him there. It was theirs. Okay. And so it does slip over to a Christological emphasis. So when you take the reason into account, because here in 16 verse 11, because the ruler of this world has been judged, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me, the cross is not the place where Jesus was condemned. It's the place where the ruler of this world is defeated and condemned. And they need the Spirit's convicting work because with the absence of Christ, they, they no longer see with their own eyes the life of a man without sin. Okay? And the, the, a man who teaches with authority that they themselves had to recognize. He's gone they can pass all sorts of judgment upon his absence. They need the Spirit's convicting work in them to understand that they are unrighteous completely in the way they evaluate Christ and his work. Ask the world what they think of Christ and you'll get all sorts of different answers, but not the right one. Yeah. Carson would say then that the righteousness is an abstract quality, like the Spirit is convicting men now because Jesus is no longer around about righteousness is, or is it more of it's the, the, the quality belonging to the world, the world's righteousness? It's understanding of its own goodness and its own thoughts and judgments. That's what he's looking at, the way they, it's the false judgment false understanding. This is, yeah, it, it's falsely accusing him of being unrighteous and themselves of being righteous. The world does falsely judge Christ in its own self-centered, self-perceived righteousness. Okay? But it doesn't have any. It's a righteousness like the Pharisees. Righteousness like men in Isaiah 64. Your righteousness is as filthy rags because it's your own perception thereof. Whatever the final verdict on how to interpret, so far as Satanology is concerned, the fact of his defeat is as clear as a bell. So you can make some closing remarks. We do have a hostile adversary who seeks the right to test severely and to destroy faith. We do have an inter interceding saviour who prays that our faith not fail. We do have a sovereign God who has already dealt with Satan both at the cross and in terms of a predetermined eternal destiny that we can acknowledge from the Word of God. So let's do so. Then I gave you another page, Matthew 12, Luke 11 and Mark 3, statements about casting out demons by Beelzebul and Satan casting out Satan. Don't need to spend a lot of time there just to observe a few things. Matthew 12, there's a contempt, contemptuous charge delivered by the Pharisees against Christ. Verse 24, this man, Hutos, I think you can translate that, this fellow, that guy, in a sort of contemptuous way. 
Cos said, that guy casts out demons by the prince of the demons. That's who he is. That man is doing that. Level that charge against him for his healing of that man. But you'll remember, all you have to do is drop back one verse. The multitudes were amazed. For they'd seen a demon-possessed man who was blind and dumb, healed, so that he both spoke and saw. Incredible. So they were amazed and began to say to themselves, with the question beginning with Meti, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? In other words, is this the Messiah? Now, obviously, the Pharisees are not going to be too happy to hear the crowds asking that question. And so perhaps they sought to deflect the question or to introduce or to strengthen, might be better, the element of unbelief in the query. This, this can't be the son of David, can it? And what they want the crowd to say is, no, it can't be. So they react. That man casts out demons by the prince of demons. Can't be the Messiah. Because the Messiah wouldn't be acting according to the power of Satan. In other words, they'd be lured by the words of the Pharisees. So several realities are given expression here. And notice these, they are not questioned nor denied by Jesus at all, that Beelzebub is the ruler, Archonti, of the demons, the head of the hierarchy. And B, that other exorcisms were taking place, not questioned or denied. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. It's a straightforward statement of a well understood principle, proverbial type statement, but it's, it's real, it's truthful, it's in, in accord with real life. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? A good question. Because on the, on the basis of the well-known proverbial statement, the well-known fact of real life, it couldn't stand. They'd have to say, it'll fall. So it brings back to them, facing them with the fallaciousness of their own argument. If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Excellent, penetrating question. Consequently, they shall be your judges. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now just think your way through that. Mark records the response of Jesus as being parabolic. But it's a general principle to a specific application that leaves them exposed with the fallacy of their own argument because well-known fact, opposition within any unit or house or institution or kingdom is self-destructive. Then the application to Satan, his own kingdom would fall. So there's, there's a level of unthinkability that Satan would take steps against his own demons in their evil work. For that would mean that he would then ho be hostile against himself. And in fact, Mark is blunt at the end of verse 26. He just says, it's finished. It's ended. There's incongruity here. Satan casting out Satan. The question on exorcism arises, and think about this. The exorc exorcism activity of your sons. The implication seems to be that 
that satanic power was not involved. Okay, you follow? If Satan casts out Satan, it's self-destructive. So your sons cast out demons by what power? Whose side are they on? And remember that at that time the Jews believed that when a rabbi or a pupil, a disciple, a follower, one that's been taught by the Pharisees, delivered someone from demon bondage, it was considered a sign that God himself was working through the exorcist. Okay? That's what they thought. This obviously was God working through them, with all their ritual and laborious stuff that they did. Exorcism occurred. God has been at work. Um, Jesus responding to their own argumentation. And it, it stands as an indication of double standards, doesn't it? Of course. If Satan cannot cast out Satan, because that would destroy his own kingdom, and if you believe that God casts out Satan or demons, your followers having divine power to do that, then really I'm casting out Satan by God's power too. By saying that I'm doing it by Satan, you're applying a double standard. We do it by God. You do it by Satan. But you've forgotten the principle. Satan hostile to Satan. Can't be. Argument destroyed. Fallacy exposed. A witness against the Pharisees themselves. I've said, think about 12 verse 34 and let me read it here. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. It's an interesting statement and it belongs right here. Because don't expect them to speak the truth. They're not going to be able to do so. They will apply double standards. That's the hallmark of the world, is it not? Double standards in spiritual things. Logic doesn't enter into the question because the logic of man is going to be subordinated to his own depravity. In order to make his point, their hatred for Christ was reaching a peak in Matthew's Gospel. The time had come to speak evil of Christ. And don't expect them to speak good. They're speaking out of what belongs to them naturally. They could not say, they would not say, in response to the crowd's query, you got it right. He is the son of David. He does cast out demons by the power of God. Couldn't say that. He does it by Satan. You've forgotten the principle. Double standard applying. Now when you put the direct assertions and the proverbial like statements in the passage together, you can formulate a response or you at least can make some observations I've set out just for you. For you. The act of casting out is an act of opposition against the hold and power of another. It is breaking the power of Satan in another's life. This involved the very power of God. In Numati Theo of Matthew, in Doctulo Theo of Luke, pointing to that divine power in operation. Christ is declaring his ability to bind and conquer Satan. 
but note he didn't say he had done it or was going to be in the process of doing it. He just simply leaves it on the table in front of the Pharisees. I can do this. Strong man Satan can be bound by me. In other words, they were to think seriously about the power of the Messiah in relation to Satan. Stanley Toussaint in his commentary on Matthew says this, Christ by a parable, picking up on Mark's statement, states that in order for kingdom conditions to exist on earth, Satan must first be bound. Jesus does not say he has bound Satan. He simply sets the principle before the Pharisees. His works testify to his ability to bind Satan and they attest his power to establish the kingdom. In fact, the kingdom is here, in the presence of the king. Satan is strong, active, and not involved in works which would render himself powerless. But this raises the question, looking for your answer, raises the question, can Satan deliberately deceive by granting power to his own people to cast out his own cohort? Given the principle that Satan cannot hostilely stand against Satan, that Satan can't cast out his own because then he's self-destructing. Response. Yeah, Nathan. Uh, it seems at first glance that no, Satan is not allowed to do that. If he was, wouldn't that invalidate Christ's argument? if God were to allow Satan to deceive in that way? Well, yeah, on the surface, it would appear to do that. You're right. Yeah. Um, maybe for, um, this is just hypothetically speaking, but for the purpose of, how do I put it, a greater deception, perhaps, in a trade-off for a smaller deception, is it possible that he might some kind of, I don't know, appearance of that. You know what I mean? This is kind of coming from the book we read from Napier where he talks about treacherous trade-offs in there. I don't know if you recall that section. Yeah. He talks about Satan giving something, you know, giving a little ground in, in one respect and then gaining okay. a greater ground. And what you're doing here is correct. You are understanding clearly what Satan casting out Satan is about. It is hostile reaction to overthrow, to break the hold off, to work within your own strategy to deceive is not to hostilely break the power off. So if you understand Satan casts out Satan, that is, he is breaking the opposition breaking the hold, he's establishing victory over another portion. That would be self-destruct. But if Satan, in order to further his own kingdom, acts deceitfully, it is not Satan attacking Satan to destroy satanic power. It's Satan using satanic power to deceive the world into thinking that they have gained something they have not gained. Okay. I refer you to page 71 of Konya for a very brief description of that. It's not a division of his kingdom. It's furtherance of his kingdom. And don't be surprised since he's the master of lies and deceit. Such as possible. Yeah, I'm glad you reminded of Napier's book. Sam. Uh, in terms of his kingdom and he's standing over his ruler over his kingdom, there's no consistency within his kingdom. I and mean, how, how can the house stand together? And I was trying to get this verse in that light. Then there's a consistency within the kingdom. Within his own? Within his own. Within his own kingdom. Uh -huh. He's not going to break his own power. He's not going to have victory over the demon. 
telling the demon to leave in response to somebody else that he's motivating is strategy, not defeat. He's not defeating in that case. It's not attacking to defeat and depose, to break the hold of at all. Yeah. That seems to be validated actually in uh, Matthew chapter 7 where he says, you cast out demons in my name, you know, and Christ is, so I never knew you. You know, so, so it's like yeah. there was some kind of activity going on, but I, I agree that uh, there's probably for the greater deception. Right. It, it means you have to step back and say, the your sons, the rabbis, the peoples of the Pharisees, was it divine power working through them? Or was it satanic deception working through them? Given the impression of what is not. Okay. And there's a difference. Maybe it was divine power in some cases. Maybe it wasn't in others. Yeah, Nathan. Oh, let me just be a stick in the mud. I'm just trying to think through this. It seemed in verse 25 and 26, Matthew 12, it, it appears to me as if casting out a demon is equated to Satan being divided against himself. Yeah, and the casting out being right. throwing out, breaking the hold in opposition. Right. So, so in other words, any time a demon is cast out, stepping back from the question of power, any time a demon is, is cast out, it is breaking Satan's power. I mean, I, un I understand the argument of strategy. It, it makes perfect logical sense. I'm just trying to see that in the text. I mean, tell you, the text has stated the clear principle. Satanic power against satanic power so that Satan destroys himself, stands against himself, breaks his own hold, has victory over his own opposition. That's what's been referred to. That's self-destruct, that's division, that can't stand. But so, now you ask the question, which has not been dealt with in the text, what about the case of release from demons that is obviously not the divine power of God because of who is doing the casting out? So can you have deceit can you have a deceitful strategy? And that's the question that always arises. Can you have a deceitful strategy that is not Satan dividing himself? Yeah, if it's not real casting out, it's a false perception thereof because he has granted his own instruments. He's worked a strategy here. So maybe I should say, probably better to put it like this, raises the question of him deliberately deceiving by appearing to grant power to his own wicked followers to appear to cast out demons from somebody else. Let me put that appear in rather than leaving it as by granting power to cast out demons because it is not the breaking of the hold of it is furthering his own kingdom, furthering his own, it's for his own benefit, by appearing to do something he's not really doing. And he doesn't fit within the category of standing against himself. It's, it's in another ballpark. That's, that's what we're saying. The text says this, understood. Now what about this reality? was not done in the divine power of God. If it's not done in the divine power of God, there's only one other power that could do it. But it can't be destroying himself. So it therefore fits within the category of deception. Appearing to do what isn't being done. And that would explain statements like Matthew 7. Yeah. Seems to me there's a there's a presumption there with regard to Satan. That's that he's rational in what he does. Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking in terms he's of he's rational enough to know when to deceive. Well, you know, I'm thinking in terms of, of human warfare. 
with despots and uh, dictators who have turned on their own troops, on their own people, and, and everybody would say it's destructive to kill your own troops, but they do it all the time. But it, we consider it to be an irrational behavior, but it seems to be common in those people we would consider to be evil on a physical point. Well, nevertheless, there's a rationality, isn't there? A level of rationality in that he makes decisions. And deceiving at this point would not be rash anger dashing out. It would be subtle strategy, deceive, that we may benefit. Fool people into thinking that if you follow me, you can do this type of activity. They don't think rationally. If this is not of God, it must be of Satan. But Satan can make people think, and this, this, you add to the strategy, make them think that they're doing this in the name of Jesus, which is extremely clever. Yeah. Is there possibly another way to look at that third category, the one where you have ungodly people, you know, casting out demons? Um, maybe you could look at it as the principle that God does use ungodly people to accomplish His will. For instance, when He puts right. a lion spirit in the mouths of the prophets, right. you know. And uh, I, I, I don't know what your take is on the Witch of Endor, but there's a case where an ungodly person actually, quote unquote, accomplishes something, although it wasn't her, by divine power. Yeah. So I don't know if maybe that's another way to recategorize it. But he uses ungodly people to appear to do what they don't really do in order to advance his own kingdom. Because if it was God that did the casting out, as, as he did through the disciples, there was permanent deliverance. Okay. If it's not God, it's not permanent deliverance, it's deceitful deliverance. Anyway, Konya has some discussion on that. You can think about it some more. Pharisees expressing their extreme opposition. Found the article, something you said, Dennis, triggered my own hand. Put it in the front pocket of my briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> I deceived myself. <laughs> something you said. It's lateral thinking. It went off at a... It's this article, The Function of the Paraclete in John 16. ABL 98.4.79, if you're interested. Okay, we've got a few minutes to follow up on a couple of things. And that is, at the end of your notes, the section that begins spiritual warfare. Obviously, obviously the next step, and the last discussion we, we just had is going to impact the whole discussion of spiritual warfare anyway. Can you see that top thing? <coughs> Got it now? JBL 98 slash 479. It's more of a technical presentation of why you should maintain the symmetry. Very good article. Okay. Spiritual warfare. Increasing attention being given to it, particularly in missions. It's become very prevalent on the mission field and in mission societies in their reading and their thinking. Mission magazines are dealing more with it. In fact, this particular book of 
Overcoming the World Missions Crisis, an excellent book, has a chapter in there by John Hart on demonology and the mission <coughs> field that is an outstanding piece of work. I'll be giving you some information from it. A lot of attention. The reason for missions to argue the way they do is that in some areas, many have come to Christ. It's been an overwhelming response over the years. Missionary work in Africa being a classic example. But in other regions, where missionaries have worked just as hard as their colleagues elsewhere have seen very little response. Islamic countries being a classic example. Now surely the spirit can work as effectively in an Islamic country as he can in an African country. Is that true? Second, setting aside for now the doctrine of election leaving it at the level of the effective work that can be seen as the result of the hard work of missionaries. What accounts for the difference? And if you set aside the doctrine of election and the purpose, sovereign purpose of God in each area, you are left with only, one question, with only one answer. There must be something that prevents people listening to the gospel. And that has got to be demonic activity. Or spiritual warfare. You follow? It automatically arises in missionary thinking. Set aside the purpose of God, the sovereign plan of God for Islamic countries, for Africa, and say, okay, then there must be something that hindered these people from listening. And that missionary tried just as hard, presented the gospel just as clearly. So that culture must be a, a, such a demonically controlled culture that it prevents the people from hearing the gospel. And that became the response, particularly in Western Europe. It's got to be Satan preventing missions from being successful in France, in Italy, in, partic in particular. So here's a small sampling of the wide variety of material available. I've given it for your information. Broniger. When angels fear to tread. I'll be di I'll be referring to that article. Thomas Ice and Robert Dean, Holy Rebellion. Robert Gerlich has an article called Spiritual Warfare, Jesus, Paul and Peretti. It's in yeah, I'm putting the three on the same level as it's in um, Newmar, so you know where it's coming from. But the footnotes are very instructive. This is an article where the content of the article ain't too much good, but the footnotes are very good. They, they, they give you indications of places to go for information. By the way, the Peretti family, if I understood this correctly since I knew his sister, grew up in an Assemblies of God background and were involved in missions work in Italy for a long time. He didn't intend to write a theology at all. It was just a, a story based upon demons and spirits and so on. And I understand that he was as surprised as anybody else at how it just exploded. Of course, he rode the crest of the wave as far as he could. But it was, it was amazing how many people thought that this was a systematic treatment theologically of demonism. It wasn't at all. It's not what he intended. Hebert has an article on warfare and worldviews, and I want to respond to his The Floor of the Excluded Middle. Bob Larson, some of you may know that name. Has a little has a book called Larson's Book of Spiritual Warfare, telling you how to go about it. He's very much involved in that now. 
originally his ministry was one of demonstrating why rock music is devilish. And he did a very good job. I remember him coming out to South Africa and coming to our little church, him and his band, and he, he gave a demonstration without warning. He, he didn't warn anybody. He said, at the beginning of the meeting, let me demonstrate for you what a rock band sounds like. Blew the walls out of our little church chapel. Mm -hmm. The little old ladies were very disturbed. <laughs> Couldn't, and I couldn't handle the noise the decibels were so high. From there he talked about the lifestyle of those associated with rock music. And then as the years went by, he became more involved in demon, act, demon casting out, which is associated with the drug world, that he finally put together this little book. It tells you how to do it. Peter Wagner territorial spirits and world missions have to talk about that in some detail in in the next three or four sessions giving you a couple of definitions and descriptions simply put it's just the ongoing hostility of satan which we know very well from scripture using every means to defeat god and his plan for time and eternity involves the believers at the individual level as well as the people of God at a corporate level receiving. And this definition, by the way, recognizes that there is the, proof, the permission of God to do what he does. Detzler, excellent article myths about spiritual warfare, says this is as old as the Garden of Eden. From the very dawn of creation we've had such opposition. True. You move to the next section and spiritual warfare is more than ongoing hostility and you realize that the definition is going to move from simple opposition and hostility to it is God clearly manifesting his power through his people for the world to see his triumph as the devil and the forces of darkness around it. You see the difference in the definition? It has taken that extra step. There will be an ongoing overt triumph on the part of the people of God against the powers of darkness. A public humiliation of the devil would be words to use. Wagner puts it this way, my principal calling is to obey the Great Commission. Fine. I like that. Agree. Stamp of approval. Standing right behind you. And then he says, Thus, I see territorial spirits chiefly in terms of their alleged ability to prevent the spread of the gospel. Hold it for a second, sir. I ain't walking behind you anymore. Separating company. Fulfilling the Great Commission? Fine. Territorial spirits exerting their influence to hinder the gospel? No. Something's not right in your definition. And so you get those that are teaching deliverance ministry as the alternative designation for spiritual warfare. Four emphases, and we'll pick up there, I'll just introduce you to them, the believer's authority, the very real possession of possibility of demon possession of a believer, the specific identifying, commanding and rebuking of demons, and the prayers to bind Satan repeatedly at every meeting, church service, Bible study, so on. And the collection of case studies that is compiled to give you something of a manual about what to do when you encounter a demon. Assuming that these things are going to be done that way. Here's the closing paragraph. It is necessary to first engage in spiritual warfare in order that the ears of the people may be opened. Spiritual warfare is not evangelism. It is pre-evangelism. Significant statement by Neil Michel. From 
an article in this magazine. Frontier Missions, International Journal of it, Spiritual Warfare, detailed as to what takes place on the mission field or should be taking place on the mission field, otherwise you may not have success in evangelism or church planting. It's pathetic. I telegraph my response. I want to pick up on this and expose you to their teaching because some of your people are going to pick up articles of this nature, read it, and maybe think it's the right thing to do.